Wake Up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again. We're back. It's your number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. We're so happy and humbled to be able to be with you to start off this Sunday morning. Listen, we've got an exciting program for you to inspire, encourage, and empower you. And we've got an interesting guest. And I want to say good morning to the bishop right now, Bishop David Cheney. God bless you. God bless you, Bishop. Now, for those of you who are not aware, Bishop Cheney took over New Fellowship. And of course, he's going to be sharing with us a lot about that transition because it was kind of unique Absolutely. In, a, in a sense. And also your vision for a new fellowship moving forward, correct? Certainly. Certainly. All right. Looking forward to that. So let's make our way to our first spoken word. Bishop Dante Hickman over at Southern Baptist Church. He's awaiting us there with the word. And then we'll be right back with our guest right here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman, Sr. By the time of our text, Deborah, who was both a judge and a prophetess in Israel, was singing a song of praise about the prose in chapter 4 after having led the children of Israel to win in battle against the Canaanites. The children of Israel had been in Canaanite bondage for more than 20 years because of their sin and their disobedience to God. And it was becoming God's pattern whenever they would be determined to live in disobedience to him to turn them over into the captivity of their enemies put them in Egyptian bondage, brought them out, brought them into Canaan. They messed up, turned their backs on God, and they put them back in bondage again, but this time to the Canaanites. Their captivity was always a consequence of their sin, not because the enemy was always stronger, not because the enemy was always bigger or better, but simply a consequence of their sin. And when God uses our enemies to chastise us, our enemies should not become overly confident because it's just temporary working for our good. Over a process of time, prayer and repentance, God will cause a turnaround and a takeover and put his people back in positions of power and of promise. But in this instance, <laughs> he uses a woman by the name of Deborah. Yeah. I reiterate that Deborah was a judge and a prophetess in Israel in the Old Testament. And she is widely accepted in rabbinic traditions today as a woman of great military prowess, as well as a prophet of God. And she was acknowledged and accepted as a judge long before she won the battle that delivered Israel from Canaan. For she had won the hearts of the people and they trusted her judgment and her spiritual leadership. Read in chapter 4, and you will see it clearly that she sat under the palm trees. And the people came up to her with all of their grievances, and she provided them with righteous judgment. This, in my estimation, should be the end of discussion for any religious, governmental, educational, or corporate institution on whether or not a woman should be a pastor, a leader, a principal, or a chief executive, and equally paid as their male counterparts. Women have been effective spiritual and secular leaders for a long time. Now, there were 12 judges in Israel, namely Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, 
Tola, Jair, Jephthah, Ibsen, Ellen, Abdon, and Samson. And they are described as people who served as military leaders in times of crisis, in the period before Israelite kings were established. And Deborah was also a prophetess, which meant she could hear, see, and speak on behalf of God. Simply put, she had faith and she could fight. And if the truth be told, a lot of us made it to be who we are and where we are because we had a mother or a mother figure who knew the Lord and she knew the street. And she could pray for you and protect you at the same time. While Deborah was the only woman judge and prophetess, she stood out not merely for her gender, but for how she was able to minister to the people and solve their grievances and how she was able to get the victory over the Canaanites. And if you read Judges chapter four, you will note that Deborah was able to win against the Canaanites because she was strategic. Let the church say strategic. strategic. In chapter four, she tells Barak, the commander of the army, how many soldiers to deploy and from which tribes and where they should go and how they should attack and that they would win. I'm trying to help you to understand that she had heard from the Lord and believed God for the victory and walked by faith. And that's the strategy of every faithful and successful mother, to hear, to believe, and to walk by faith in the Lord. That's how grandmothers and mothers made it through the Great Depression. That's how they made it through Jim and Jane Crow. That's how they made it through lynchings and bombings. That's how they made it through drug infiltration and mass incarceration of their sons. They made it leaning on Jesus. And can I tell you, church, that every new generation mother should take a page out of the old generation of mothers and say, give me that old time religion. If it was good for my dear mother, then it's good enough for me. When you look back on how your mother made it with hardly any money, with hardly any resources, with men that walked out on her, with your children and other people's children, and you wonder how she did it, she did it leaning on the Lord, and the same God she depended upon is the same God you can depend on. Deborah was able to win against the Canaanites because she was strategic. Look at somebody tell them I had a strategic mama. And she was selfless. Let the church say selfless. She wasn't selfish. She was selfless. She sacrificed what she had for the benefit and for the blessing of somebody else. How many nights did she not be able to go out to the club because she had to clean your snotty nose? And then after that, you brought your children to her as if that was all she had to do. The Bible says that Barack, listen, was afraid to go without Deborah to the point that he told Deborah that he would only go and do what she told him if she went with him. And to his shock and amazement, she agreed to go with him. She didn't make it about her. She didn't make it about her self-preservation or her power. She didn't look at him and say, if I was a man, then you would have just did what I told you to do. He said, I will go if you go. And you know what she said? Then I'm going. She knew, Deacon Corpru, that she had the favor of God and she wasn't scared to fight. 
But the real intriguing part about her for me is that she said to him, I will go with you, but you won't get the glory for the Lord will deliver Sisera by the hand of a woman. Oh my God, this is deep. She was so selfless that she wanted to give him the strategy to win and allow him to take the credit. Y'all ain't listening yet. How many of us get the glory for something a mother did in our story? And in the book I'm reading on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., much of who he was and what he did was because of the influence and inspiration of his grandmother Delia, of his mother Alberta, of his sister Christine, and his wife Coretta. And where would we be if it wasn't for our mothers? And some of y'all may not be able to say amen because even if you had a bad mother, she still made a decision to give birth to your bad butt. Come on, somebody ought to say thank you, mom, for making the decision to have me and not get rid of me. But before I let this go, before I let you go to do whatever you're going to do, I had to ask the same question that's in all of our heads, and that is, how did she do it? How did Deborah become a judge and a prophetess in Israel as a woman and so successful at it? And I read everything I could, I could find to read. And it's not surprising that there is no extra biblical material that describes how she became a judge and a prophetess. But it was not until I read chapter 5, which is Deborah's song of praise, that I discovered how she did it. And let me park here parenthetically and tell you that sometimes we have to sing our own song of praise. Because can't nobody tell your testimony like you can. Yeah. Folks around you will leave out parts of your testimony. They, they won't tell people how you struggled. They won't tell people how you came through. They won't tell people how the Lord brought you up. They won't tell people how the Lord cleaned you up. They'll tell them the bad stuff, but they won't tell them the good stuff about your character. Look at somebody and tell them, sometimes you got to toot your own horn. Bible says she sung her own song and Elder Reed in verse 7 she said village life ceased it ceased in Israel until I Deborah arose arose a mother in Israel in other words their community and culture had become broken as a result of the captivity and hard oppression of the Canaanites. And it got so bad that they became lifeless. They became loveless. They became murderous. They, they, they lost their sense of who they were and they began to pray to the Lord for deliverance. Yeah. And what was interesting, church, is that they still had armies. They still had resources. They still had skills, they still had abilities, and they still had men, but they didn't have a leader. Subsequently, Deborah said, they ain't have nothing until I rose. A mother in Israel. She wasn't appointed, <laughs> she wasn't elected, she wasn't consecrated like King Charles. The Bible says she just rose to the occasion. She demonstrated, like most black sisters, that somebody has to get up and stop this. 
Somebody has to rise up and stop our boys from killing each other in the streets. Somebody has to rise up and stop the proliferation of drugs in our community. Somebody has to rise up and stop the sex trafficking of our daughters. And somebody has to rise up and stop the disintegration of our families. And can I tell you, Southern Baptist Church, that that's what mothers do. They step up when others won't stand up. Somebody ought to help me preach. They show up just when you need them the most. <laughs> yes, and they support you when everybody else has given up on you. And let me drop it like it's hot. I mean, even God let them go, but Deborah took them in. And I need about 10 people in this house that can testify when your back was up against the wall, when you didn't know your foot from your toe, from your finger, when everybody had counted you out, when you had that baby out of wedlock and people knew that you wasn't married and you looked like somebody that wasn't from your family, when you went to jail and you came home, it was your mama that dusted you off, cleaned you up, and told you, God will take care of you. Because that's, that's what mothers do. And we should thank God for a mother that didn't keep what she had to offer to herself. But in the time of agony, <laughs> She made herself available to help us to win the battles that we had already lost. And what I love about Deborah and mothers like Deborah is she was a force to be reckoned with. Have you ever wondered what made or makes your mother so strong? I mean, with or without a man? I'm about done. Deborah said, Dante, what made me rise as a mother in Israel after we had been knocked down was my bee nature. And trust me, I'm a Bible preacher. And the bee you thinking about is not the bee that I'm talking about. Deborah's name in the Hebrew literally means bee. B-E-E. -E. And I said, God, what you want me to preach about a bee? And God said, Dante, you need to understand that in some situations, it will take a bee-like nature to get you out. And I don't know about you, but I thank God for my Deborah. Because my Deborah had a stinger. I feel like preaching. Look at your neighbor and tell him my Deborah had a stinger. And when I read about a honeybee, when a honeybee stings, <laughs> its stinger, the venom sac, and other parts of the honeybee's body are pulled out and left behind and kills the bee. Can I tell you that mothers <laughs> are typically pre pleasant. My mother, she would talk like a Negro until the phone rang and it was somebody important on the other line. Don't take off stairs and get me that, that shirt. How are ya? What's taking you so long? Make up your bed. Bring. Hello. <laughs> yes, just one moment. Dante, have you gotten the shirt? <laughs> Anybody had a mother like mine? Mothers are typically pleasant, but they can be poisonous and painful to somebody who's a threat. And while she can be vulnerable, she will make you feel like the victim if you get on her bad side. Come on, keep it real in here. And she will die to defend her children. 
somebody ought to thank God that some demons could not get to you because your mama stung them away. And sometimes she had to sting you <laughs> to make the right decisions. Sometimes she had to sting you to go to school on time. Sometimes she had to sting you to clean up after yourself. Sometimes she had to sting you to go to church and find Jesus. And now you're in church thanking God for the sting of your mother. I need 20 people to give God praise that your mother stung you in the right direction. I thank God for my Deborah because my Deborah had a stinger, but not only did she have a stinger, she had a sweetener. Preach, boy, preach. I'm doing the best I can because the nature of a bee is to collect pollen and nectar for others. And as it is shared, it becomes honey. And the nectar of our mothers is their testimony of how good God has been and how God brought them out, how God brought them over, and how God brought them through some of the roughest seasons of their lives. And the reason why you and I have survived our bitterness and our brokenness is because they made our sour situation sweeter with the nectar of their optimism, with the nectar of their faith, with the nectar of their hope, their love, their prayer, and their forgiveness. And many of us have testimonies of how our mothers mended our broken hearts how she helped us to get over our ex and on to our next and how she helped us to try again after every failure in our lives and can I tell you church I believe that while it was painful for Mary the mother of Jesus to stand there and watch her son die on the old rugged cross between two thieves in shame for the sins of the whole world that her presence helped Jesus to get through the pain to the promise it helped him to get through the humiliation to the elevation and it helped him to get from the res rejection to the resurrection and I wonder is there anybody in the house that almost gave up you're almost threw in the towel you almost waved the white flag of surrender you almost lost your joy but you had a mother that knew how to pray you had a mother that knew how to encourage your heart and she tell you be not dismayed whatever be time God will take care of you and if you trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him he will direct your paths she told you he will provide he will protect he will keep you he will heal you he will deliver you he will forgive you he will give you another chance have I got a witness here thank God for a devil Thank God for a mother who had a stinger, who had a sweetener, but then finally I'm closing. She had a sound. I need somebody in the house to shake somebody's hand and tell them my mother, she had a sound. That's what bees would do. They had a sound that we call a buzz. And and the buzz is caused by the rapid movement and vibration of the wing muscles located in the upper body and the rapid contraction of the wing flight muscles is what caused the high pitch whining buzzing sound and somebody knows that your mother had a sound a sound a prayer
praise and thanksgiving for the God that kept her and kept you. And what I love about Deborah is that she won the battle without having to fight. I need somebody in the house to look at your neighbor and say, my mother won some battles. She didn't have to use a gun or a knife. She didn't have to use her, her fists. She didn't have to cuss, but she had some spiritual weapons called fasting and praying and serving and giving and worshiping God. Can I tell you what the book says? She spoke God's word and she sang her song. I need 30 folk to holler. My mother spoke his word and sang her song and prayed her prayer and praised her God and the buzz from her prayer, the buzz from her praise, the buzz from her word, the buzz from her song, the buzz from her testimony, bless them to win the battle and live in peace for 40 years, which was double for their trouble. And I need somebody who is grateful today. Your life is better because of your mother. You've gone further because of your mother. She didn't drive what you drive. She didn't live where you live. You're living with double. You know why you got double? Because she gave you a stinger. She gave you a sweetener. And she gave you a sound. Shake somebody's hand. Fist bump somebody. Look in somebody's direction and say, I'm where I am. I'm blessed and highly favored because my mother gave me a stinger. My mother gave me a sweetener and my mother gave me a song blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine I'm an heir of salvation purchased by God born of his spirit washed in his blood that was her story but this is my story this is my song I'll be praising my mama savior my grandmama savior my savior all the day long shout yeah shout yes shout thank you shout glory shout hallelujah yeah yeah I may not be the best of anything, nor have the best of everything. Sometimes I feel like I'm the least of all. But my mama said, I know someone who has everything. And that someone is my everything and I'm happy just to know I'm his child you've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor if you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566
Bishop Cheney, so good to, again to have you with Absolutely. us. And uh, many may not be familiar, even when we said as a pastor of New Fellowship, the connection there. Uh, your predecessor, who was a dear friend of mine, transitioned. And uh, as fate would have it, or maybe God would have it, uh, you wound up being called uh, to take the mantle of leadership. What was that experience like, and how did they find you? Well, taking over a church like New Fellowship was a tremendous undertaking. Following the lead of such an uh, establishment, Bishop Kevin A. Rogers, yeah. um, he did a tremendous work 43 years ago, in fact, yes. this year. And um, coming in under what he had done in his vision, but the timeliness was rough. He had passed, um, the uh, church had gone nearly three years without a pastor. You had wow. the Freddie Gray riots that were going right, on. The right. church had experienced its second fire. And so the selection for me took nearly three years. The church literally yes. went literally three years, but that speaks to the foundation that the church is on. Some churches can't survive, survive three, years three years that's without a, long time. a pastor, yeah. but it did. It's, its core group of its deacon, its ministry, the faithful members stayed together because they had a strong foundation. Uh, ironically enough, this is my 20th year as a bishop, and the same bishop that consecrated me consecrated Bishop Rogers. Wow. And so he knew of the connection of the church. At the time, I was living in Dallas. Uh, both Bishop Rogers and I went to Forest Park. Okay. I was married in 1990. So you're Baltimore. Baltimore, and yeah, a lot of people think I'm I'm from Texas, hey, but Texas, I spent boy, but I spent I spent 30 years in Texas. Um, and, but coming back, I felt God wanted me to come back because of the Freddie Gray riots. Okay. Watching TV, CNN, I'm seeing. So you came of, back before the call. But yeah. No, no, I was before. still in Texas. But I was watching television. I was okay. watching the riots, and I'm seeing pastors that I knew uh, when I first got saved, who were wow. young pastors. Now they're in the city, and I'm seeing my city up in flames. I'm seeing all of this, and I was speaking to Bishop Golfin, and he said, "Listen, I think there may be an opportunity for you to go back. Would you be willing to go back?" I said, "If it's God's will, I'll go back," and wow. I did, and um, was met with just such amazing people. But any transition is always difficult. Sure, sure. What about uh, dealing with, uh, and I guess after three years' time, maybe not as much, but the grieving element of the fellowship because of the loss of such a popular pastor? Oh, uh, grief is an is a interesting thing because you truly never get over it. There is no timetable. And some people assume you should move past it. But the relationship between a pastor and a member is unique because yeah. pastors are connected to the members outside of the four walls of the church. Right. Uh, they're there from baptisms, they're there from graduations, yeah. they go to basketball, all ballet, the ups all the ups, the all the downs, and so it's really like a family. And it was rough because we still have people in the church who've been there the entirety of the 43 years. In fact, when I did a survey, most of the members have been there 20, 30, and 43 years. So, so these all are they it. knew was all Bishop they knew Rogers. was Kevin Rogers. That's right. it. They, all they knew was his preaching, his singing, his ministry. And so coming in, it was a it was a change because so many people said that I reminded them in so many ways of Bishop Rogers, but I never met. Bishop Rogers. Wow. And so one of the things that new pastors have to understand when they take over a church, um, you can't inflate a relationship you never had. That's correct. And But people want you to. They want you to continue to acknowledge his name and do this, that, and the other, and you're constantly reminded, oh, Bishop used to do this, or Bishop used exactly. to do that. But you have to try I to, remember when Bishop preached that message. That's that message, that's right. Yeah. Did you get his notes? And you have to do a lot of smiling yeah. and a lot of, no, but it's gonna be okay. But when it's God's will, transition works. There's yeah. always going to be some kind of nutrition. Some will fall off. God will send new yeah. ones. Yeah. There are some that were diehard Bishop Rogers members, and you have to acknowledge that. I understand that. Yeah. But then there are foundational people, people who have said, I'm here to help do the work. And Bishop Rogers established certain things in that community, and I'm so glad to be able to come in, pick up where he left off. The understanding is that the uh the mantle of leadership must be perpetual. It must move forward. It must. It must move forward. And unfortunately, all of us have 
a tenure on how long we can carry the mantle. Right. And so those of us who are under the mantle have to accept the fact that when God affords the opportunity for transition, mm -hmm. be willing to embrace it. Uh, a lot of senior pastors, um, unfortunately, in our churches, when we retire, it's normally at the funeral. And that's not what I want for my life. I'm, I'm, I'm now that's having good. a grandson son in Texas. My wife is heading back to Texas to see our children. And I want to be able to enjoy those things. And we have to learn to set up succession. And we can't be afraid of it. We can't, we can't worry about what's happening. But unfortunately, lots of times pastors just get into the work. They never stop. They never look up. And next minute you know, 30, 40 years have gone by. And but listen, then, now we're going to get ready to go to our next sure. um uh, speaker, spoken word, but I did want to uh, kind of set the table before we close out with this question. Now that you're in, what is your vision moving forward for New Fellowship? Well, we are now going to celebrate 43 years okay. of a church uh, on June 3rd at the Double Tree, and it's going to be a wonderful event. I've gone back to school to study mental health and psychology, okay. and I believe the vision that God has for me in that community is to help address a lot of the mental health issues and challenges that affect people. Far too long, I think the church has over-spiritualized everything and right. telling people you need to do more praying, you need to read more of the word. But the reality is two hours at church, a few minutes at the altar is not going to get rid of issues well, that are it. in our biology and our DNA. And so I wanna help people so that they can begin to understand and recognize that the onus is on them. Faith without works. I was going to just dead. say that faith. Absolutely. That's right. In other we, words, I've got to demonstrate it with a little with, elbow you've grease. You've got to do something. Yeah. If the doctor says to you, "You are overweight. You need to lose weight." Well, I believe you know, God. I believe I'm God. Stop that's this. right. You need to go see a nutritionist. You need to push back the plate. So there is some work to do. But many pastors don't know how to navigate that, and they don't want to lose sight of pointing people to God, believing that pointing people to science. Is not God, and All God right. is science. Well, I'm going to have to nav I'm enjoying this, but I got to navigate to our <laughs> next spoken word, and it's coming from Dr. Kenneth Robinson over at Dream Life Worship Center. Yes. We'll be back to close out with our guests. Enjoy the word and enjoy Grace and Glory. Thanks for joining Dream Life Worship Center here on Grace and Glory. Shalom, when the Midianites were stealing from the Israelites, so shalom is not just just tranquility of mind. Shalom is also well-being and prosperity to ease you so that you have nothing missing and nothing broken in your life. Somebody shout shalom. He's Adonai. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all the world that dwell therein. Come on. Are you seeing the magnificence of your God? He owns the cattle upon the thousand hills. Come on. He's Jesus. He became poor that through his poverty I might be made rich. Can you see who he is? Not, not what's in your bank account. Not, not what the economy is reporting today. Can you see who your God is? He will supply all my need according to his riches. Oh God. Some of you are going to shift dimensions because you've been extracting your money from the wrong dimension. According to his riches. Is there anybody besides me that started some things? I I'm what everything I've started, I didn't have the money for. Amen. Not in the natural. But because I operate in another dimension, watch this. I wasn't so concerned about what was in the bank account. Are you listening to me? Because I had access. You have access to the riches of glory. Are you listening to me? Now watch this, simply because your faith to God is more valuable than your financial circumstance. This is very, very important. First Peter 6 and 9, let me just read it. You don't have to turn to it. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, for now for a season. If need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire, it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing. 
Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving, watch this, the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, watch this. I want you to get this this morning. When you are going through a test or when you are going through a trial, you, and especially when, it's, when you're in need of a financial provision, the first thing you begin to do in most of us is add up our money. Do I have enough to pay for it? Come on, come on, come on, right? Right? Well, you add up your money, but God adds up your faith. Yeah. Oh, yes. How in the world did they get that? How did they pay for that? He never told you you had to pay for it. He told you you had to believe for it. So don't stop at the difficulty because of the money, because God is, he, he's not, that's not his, his concern. His concern is your faith because it's more precious than gold. All right, let me help you out. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must first believe, must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him so the first thing God says is when your trial or when you're faced with an impossible situation especially with money he first thing he says is okay where's their faith where, where do, do they trust me now I'm gonna prove it to you because it's right in this scripture you see when we are faced with challenges of need we start adding our money but God starts adding our faith your ability to believe and trust is worth more to your life than your dollars and cents all right. Now, we, we see this in, in this text. It says when Jesus lifted his eyes, he saw the multitude coming toward him. And he looks at Philip and he says, where are we going to buy bread for these to eat? Now, all the other gospels tell you that when they saw the 5,000, watch this, in a wilderness where there were no natural resources, there were no malls in the wilderness. There were no banks in the wilderness. When the others saw, because he had just finished forming miracles, there was a great revival that broke out, and so people were just coming out from everywhere because they saw the signs. And they realized, you know what, these people have been well spread spiritually, but they, they need some food. They need some provision. Now, the disciples who did not operate on the dimension of Jesus, the first thing they said is, Master, send them home. <laughs> That's what they said. Pete all that. And John says, they said to them, Lord, send them home. Send them back home. Let them buy their own food. And Jesus looked at them and said, no, because watch this, because he's operating on a different dimension. He said, no, you feed them. I mean, <laughs> they go to him, and he flips it and tells them, if you really understood faith, you would know that you get ready to participate in this miracle I'm about to perform. You feed them. And the Bible says that by this he said to them, testing them, because he knew what he would do. So whatever you're facing right now, I want to declare to you, it's already paid for in full to the overflow. It is not a question of whether or not God will do it. You're being tested. And some people never get past the test because the test is hard. The dream doesn't seem to be adding up. Because God adds your faith and you're still adding your funds. Doesn't seem to be added up. I know what God told me to do. Now notice here, this is what is important this month, is that this miracle of money is for a righteous cause. Because the righteous cause was to feed 5,000 people. No, more than 5,000, 15 to 20,000, 5,000 men. And they say to them, 
And so, so Peter, uh, Andrew says that, no, it was Andrew, let me give me a correct. <laughs> said that, no, Philip says, we only had, because let's see how difficult the situation was. We only have 200 denarii worth of bread, and it's not enough. That just, just if we gave everybody just a little, this wouldn't be enough. Now, denarii is, is a, a day's labor, so 200 is somewhere in the range of about six months worth of salary. It still wouldn't meet the need. Mm. Sounds like Jesus. If your dream is not difficult, if your vision is not hard, then it's probably not God. I'm telling you as a man who's walked by faith and not by sight, when God was in it, it was very difficult. Not difficult that it was causing me all this stress. It was difficult in the sense that it didn't add up. It didn't make sense what he was telling me to do. It was much bigger. It was much larger. And I didn't have the money for it. But here's what he knew. If you can get the faith for it, you'll see it come to pass. And so he was not working on my Lord, I got my bank account. He was working on my faith because it didn't matter what was in the bank. He already knew what he was going to do. So the test here to, right now is how do you spot, respond to not enough? That's your test this month. Because you can't shout for overflow and watch this, an abundance if you don't know how to respond to not enough. Now, one, trans one of the writers says, well, Jesus says, okay, now, just, just well, what do we have? And again, they respond, well, there is a lad. There is a lad. There is a lad. My first point was, when in the test, God has your faith, not your funds. My second point is, don't reject what God select because I'm thinking there's 500 people, 500 men, 15,000 people, that if God's going to use anybody, he's not going to use a little boy. He would get a priest or a fisherman, or somebody who's professional, or somebody who looks like they got means, or someone who looks like they got it going on. If he's going to work this thing out, he's got to get the right person, God. You got to get the right, you, we need the right people, God. But the Bible says, God see it not as man see it. For man look it on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so some of us, watch this, the, some are like lads. We're the least likely to see God move. Oh, God. And when God is about to give you a miracle, he never has to use whom you chose. Because the lad is the last person in that scenario that you would think that would be the, the conduit that God would use. Whom he's going to use for this month to break out that miracle <laughs> is not going to be who you're looking at. Don't make the same mistake that Jesse did. Jesse had seven, uh, eight sons, but he only looked at seven of them because they looked qualified. They were tall, they were handsome, but as they kept bringing it before the prophet, the prophet kept saying, no, nah, this ain't the one. Son for it. No, nah, this ain't the one. Then finally the prophet said, well, is there another one? Is there another? And, and Jesse said, oh, yeah, but it's, it's the youngest. He takes care of the sheep. I didn't even bring him out because I, I, I knew he wasn't qualified. But you got to, in this season, you cannot judge 
whom God is going to use in this month to bless you. He, they may not be saved. They may not even be born again. Are you listening to me? But God is going to raise up a lad. Is there a lad? Is there a lad? Because I'm looking for a lad because I don't need who you think I need to give you a miracle. And soon as David showed up, soon as David showed up, because Samuel said, I am going to leave this spot in this space until God shows me who's the one I'm going to anoint. And I'm here to tell you there's some things that can't not happen until you show up. And, oh my God. God has held back some things, glory to God, just waiting for you to show up. He's held back the closing. He's held back the business. He's held back the ministry, not because he doesn't have it all for you. He's held it back because he's waiting for you to show up. As soon as David comes, the lad, God says, Samuel says, he's the one. <laughs> Look at somebody tell me, you're the one. Now, the lad, this is what the Lord showed me. He said, son, the lad, the lad is also the Gen Z generation. Did you hear what I just said? Because God uses the most unlikely, the unimportant, the insignificant. He doesn't use who we think he needs to perform a miracle. He will use whomever he chooses to bless. And the lad represents what he showed me. He said, it's the youth, the younger generation is Gen Z. We will miss the miracle if we do not pay attention to the lad. It's something phenomenal about just serving God's people and serving the most unlikely. You find out that when you start serving whom God wants you to serve, my wife and I were talking about this the other day about how, you know, there's some things that we're, going, we, we're shifting in our life because we're like, okay, Lord, we, you, you're calling for a, a greater surrenderance. I said, okay, I hear what you're saying. And a greater surrenderance, is, is, it, it, it simply means that he's asking for more for you, from you. For what, for what he wants to do. And, and sometimes it's the, the, the least you would think. You, you would not think that's what he's telling you to do. But the provision in the miracle is in that thing. Now, the moment they paid attention to the lad, that's when the miracle started. What is it that you're missing in this season that in your mind ain't no way in the world this is going to bless me? It can't pay for my bills. It can't. Oh, God. Do you know that obedience opens the heavens? Gen Z is where all the resources are. The lads. <laughs> Y'all gonna get it after a while. Now, you think it ain't easy? This, wasn't e this, was, this was easy? You try taking a little child's lunch. <laughs> Had a preacher tell me that's how you can tell when the saints are immature is when you start taking their positions from them. They start acting like little children. Go into a tangerine, go into a fit. Unwilling, surrendered resources. He had to surrender his resources. Who is willing to surrender what they have in this season? And so, what did he have? Well, he, he, the Bible says that the lad just had five barley loaves and two fish. Yeah, what, what, what? Five barley loaves. You know that barley bread? was the worst, lowest in bread you can buy and eat at that time. It's like, it wasn't Sara Lee. It wasn't Wonder Bread. It was that, that value bread, that name. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna see nothing. It was the lowest end of the breads. 
that kind of bread, y'all. Okay, I don't want to offend nobody because some of y'all still own value bread. I'm just talking about those of you that may not be eating the, the basic breads. But it was what God was going to use. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, you listen to me. Uh, it's the cheapest bread. You might be looking at what you have and have determined that what you have is not enough. But God says, whatever is left in your life is enough to start this miracle. Okay, I just need somebody who can praise God for what is left. Because here's the miracle here. They didn't think it was enough. No way this is going to feed five. But God said it's enough. And I'm saying to you today, stop calling what you think is nothing. It's not something, nothing. Because God's going to use what you have. And I need about 20 people that will give God praise and tell them what I have is enough. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. You see, you go from not having enough to appreciate what you have. So God says, you have enough skills. You have enough word. You have enough education. You have enough faith. God says, in this season, I need you to understand you have enough to start what I'm getting ready to do in your life. Stop looking and comparing yourself on social media and all of these things that has got you stagnant because you keep comparing yourself. And God says, no, I ain't looking for those who are comparing themselves. I'm looking for those who understand that they have enough. Thanks for joining Dream Life Worship Center here on Grace and Glory. Also, you have time to join us online or in person. Visit dreamlifewc.com. We would love to see you at the dream. Don't miss it. Thank you, uh, Bishop Robinson. Now, now, Bishop Cheney, I want to ask you this because you mentioned about going back to school for mental health. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been very concerned about is coming out of COVID, a failure to appreciate that as a society, we may have been traumatized. And the evidence is the extremes in some of the behaviors that we see. Well, unfortunately, people have lost touch with the connection of the church. But that's in part to overchurched. And so many pastors told people, you can't miss Easter, you can't miss this, you can't uh -huh. miss that. And then we literally went two years without people being in church. But I think all of that is God, because what it has done, it has moved people out of the pews and made room for new ones to come in. But people are coming in and they're coming in with challenges and issues affected by the COVID. COVID has made us distant, not being able to socialize. And that's what the church is about. And I wanna encourage people who are at home who don't go to church anymore, you need to come back. You need to come back and get in where you fit in. All right. Well, look, <laughs> uh, tell us again. Give us the details about your 43rd event. church anniversary. It's happening June 3rd at the Doubletree Hotel. My cousin, Reverend Tommy Jenkins of the Greater St. John yes. uh, Christian Community Church, he's going to be preaching. Uh, he, His father, my great uncle, was connected to Bishop Rogers. It's going to be a wonderful event. People can find us on Facebook and watch us stream live every week. All right. Appreciate you coming Thank by. Thank you. Got to get you to come back again. Absolutely. And of course, you know, we're hoping and praying that you'll come back again. Join us again next week. Until then, as always, continue to walk in his grace and live in his glory. And we look forward to connecting with you next week right here on Grace and Glory.